For me, lowriding is the artistic representation of resistance. You get to show this is who I am, this is what I stand for, and I'm kind of claiming that space while I'm rolling in my vehicle. I've always been part of low riding since I can remember. My mom used to tell me about how my grandpa, when he came over from Mexico, he would dress up like a Pachuco and he would drive in his old Chevys just so that folks would consider him Chicano, right? Like a Mexican American and that they wouldn't deport him. You know, a lot of my uncles and my tios, they always would low ride. It was part of who they were growing up. And hearing the conversations, right, of the cars my dad would paint in the 70s or the cars that my uncle built and then being able to drive and, and listen to oldies was like priceless. So for me, it was just kind of like second nature to get into it. My car is a 1963 Chevy Impala Super Sport convertible. It's got a laurel green paint job, which is a classic original color for that year. However, this one has a little bit more fire mist in it, so when the sun hits it, it really brightens up the car. It's got a dark green canvas top. It's a custom top, along with a light green tint glass window in the back. Well, I've had the honor of working with Mercado Pinstriping. Jonathan Mercado came down and he did two-color pinstriping. He also did some gold leaf on it. The car has center gold Dayton, 72 spoke, original straight from the factories. They're triple stamp Daytons. Underneath the hood, we have a 350 engine with a 350 transmission with some billet specialty valve covers along with the serpentine kit. So the interior is a light green vinyl with the original pattern with the Dakota digital dash along with the name of the car, Paradise Gold, that was pinstriped. got power windows all throughout the vehicle, power quarters, and power vents. I have a custom air setup by Hoppos. When we got the airbags done, we were able to have the car lay valley, which means that the frame touches the ground when I lay it out. And so when I park the car, I always slam it all the way to the floor, or I just lift the front and drop the back. I also have a custom sound system with uh, two Rockford Fosgate 12 inch speakers and then two Rockford Fosgate amps. I needed to keep that 90s look. So I have a um, custom engraved plaque that says Coachella Califa's Car Club, which has a lot of meaning to me because it's the city where I'm from. We have about five members in our club with my uncle Ruben being the founding member of the club. He ran a license plate that says Coachella since like the early 1980s. So he was repping Coachella before anybody even knew what the city was. What better name than Coachella to name our car club? I was born in San Diego in the early 80s. My parents both went to San Diego State. My mom majored in liberal studies and my father in linguistics. My parents fell in love and had me. Six years later, they had my two brothers, Alex and Diego. My father ended up moving into construction and then eventually moved towards being a professional photographer for the last 30 plus years. My mom has been an educator for the last 28 years. And then in 1986, we moved to Coachella and um, I've lived there ever since. In 1992, I kept bugging my parents, like I want an Impala. And when I was 12 years old, um, I was able to purchase a Lowrider magazine in 1992 for the Cinco de Mayo issue. And it was a Laurel Green Super Sport 63 Impala. And I was like, that's my car. A couple months later, my parents purchased a 63 Super Sport hardtop for me at 12. By the time I was 16, uh, really started to mess around on the streets a lot. 
Uh, unfortunately, I was shot twice, once in the shoulder, once in the neck. I just remember seeing my parents <clears throat> and seeing that they said, you know, you can do, you can do better than this. What was interesting was they couldn't find a way to punish me because um, I was just wilding out. So they took away my heart. They sold my car. I really didn't understand why they were doing that. They understood that there was a bigger vision for me. My mom, being an educator, was able to put me in the right classes. Um, she was able to make sure that I had the right grades. And in the 90s, they were really pushing college. And um, I was able to apply to school. And I still didn't want to go. They ended up dropping me off and said, I ain't going to pick you up for a month. I went to school at Cal State Northridge. Still thinking about all the things I went through. Really got started to get settled down at school. My dad called me one day and he goes, I got a 60 Impala for you. That was my first lowrider I purchased with my own money. Growing up, I never had a teacher that looked like me. The negative narratives that were taught to me were that I wasn't smart enough, I wasn't good enough, um, that I wasn't gonna go anywhere. And these were like the comments I was receiving on the daily from my teachers. I don't think I deserve those comments and I don't think any, any student or any kid deserves those comments. When I went to college, I was as a history major, and I remember being a history major, and I was like, what am I doing with my life? And I was kind of like lost in a way. And it wasn't until I started taking Chicano study courses that it really constructed a different perspective of education for me. And then I was able to really start reflecting and unpacking a lot of the things that I experienced in education growing up. And I was like, this is crazy. Like, this is not normal for me to experience these things as a young kid in the educational system. And right after I ended college and I graduated, um, I moved right into teaching. My mom has really kind of laid the groundwork for me to do the work that I do. You gotta have a good work ethic, you gotta work hard, but then you gotta be consistent with your work ethic. And in that way, you're able to build a sense of integrity. I've been able to learn that from seeing my mom do that for the last 30 years. I've been at Desert Mirage High School for the last 14 years. I teach high school. I teach all grades in high school, 9 through 12. Um, I consider myself a Chicano Studies teacher or an Ethnic Studies teacher. I wanted to kind of come back to the neighborhood of where I'm from. I wanted to teach in the area, and I wanted to tell a different story to my students. I don't look like a traditional teacher. Ball-headed, I'm Chicano, I'm brown, and I wear Nikes and Levi's. I'm trying to be authentic to who I am. As a teacher, I think it's empowering for students to see a teacher being real with them um, because they're being real with themselves. Many of them come from farm working communities. A lot of them are first generation U.S. citizens. Some of them are undocumented. They're really trying to navigate what it means for them to reach the American dream. So it's important that you kind of, as a teacher, we start to really think about what our place is and in which ways can we inspire students to really push and strive towards their dreams for themselves. About five years ago, we started this process with a couple teaching buddies of myself. We started pushing for ethnic studies as a graduation requirement. And through my research, I was able to find a program called the Puente Project. It's a four-year uh, college preparation program for our students. Uh, we were able to develop our own twist by embedding ethnic study courses in that. We have a population of 98% Latino. It's really important that the curriculum is reflective of the students. And now the Puente program is the largest educational program in our school with a 100% success rate of getting kids to four-year universities. It was important to bring that program, but what was also important was that it centered the student and the student's identity as the way of getting them to college. 
I think it's important to understand that you have the capacity within yourself to be great. You may have been beaten down. You may have been told that you're not. Keep dreaming, keep pushing, and at the end of the day, be who you are and embrace yourself. After 10 years of teaching, really getting settled, having the financial flexibility, and I went after my dream vehicle. So it's kind of like this full story of understanding how low riding is integrated into your life. And how you're always trying to like find who you are and then at the same time kind of like claiming who you are. So I think this vehicle and embracing low riding really puts you in that position of understanding like, look, you can still claim the parts of who you are. You can still be authentic, you can still be real, but you don't have to be following that sense of violence or negativity that kind of ravages our community. So for me, it means re-transforming what it means to low ride, but also what it means to come from the city. My name is Johnny Gonzalez. I'm an educator, and I am a low rider role model.